Ah, there you are. So we are live. Uh, good morning, everyone in India, and good evening to those who are watching us on YouTube. Um, I think Professor Goldman uh, is uh, is not able to hear us right now. There's some <laughs> issue with the Zoom recently, uh, but I can hear. Yeah, perfect. So I'll just. Yes. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. My name is Ishan Sharma, and you are watching Caravan. So before going into the session, I would request all of you to just click on the subscribe button. It's a it's a red button uh, that you can click on to subscribe to listen to all the upcoming uh, academic lectures and conversations on Caravan. For today's session, I have a very special guest, and I'll introduce this session in a bit. Um, we have Dr. Sally J. Sutherland Goldman uh, joining us from Berkeley, and she is currently the senior lecturer emerita in Sanskrit, Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Dr. Sally Goldman received her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 1979. Uh, where she has taught Sanskrit and related subjects since 1981. And she is the uh, associate editor of the Valmiki Ramayana Translation Project, a very important project uh, in, in the field of uh, Sanskrit academia. And it has been useful for so many generations of scholars. She is also the co-annotator of Balakand uh, and the co-translator of Sundarkand, Yuddhakand and the Uttarakand. And much of today's session will relate to Uttarakhand, I, I believe. Uh, Dr. Sutherland Goldman has lectured, taught, and published widely in the areas of Sanskrit epic and literature and traditional South Asian constructions and representations of gender. She is the co author of Devani Praveshika, an introduction to the Sanskrit language, which was published in uh, 1980 uh, through UC Berkeley Press, and the editor of The Bridging Words. Studies on Women in South Asia. Uh, a frequent visitor to India, she has spent the spring of 2010 as a visiting professor at Center for Historical Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, in Delhi. Uh, and she was selected as the recipient to the uh, University of California at Berkeley Distinguished Teaching Award in 2012. Very recently, she and uh, Professor Robert Goldman has come up with the great single volume translation of Valmiki Ramayana, a project they, that they have dedicated their entire research on for so many decades. And it is just it has just come out with the Princeton Press uh, very recently. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goldman, for taking out time to deliver this lecture. Now, today's lecture, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is did Sita sing the blues? Uh, <laughs> and uh, this lecture will explore the portrayal of Sita in different versions of Ram Katha. We recently had a lecture on Draupadi as portrayed in different versions of Mahabharata, the great epic. And now today we'll explore Sita, another important character of, I think this, the most important and interesting character of the Ramkatha traditions. So without further ado, thank you so much, uh, Professor Goldman, for taking out so much time. And over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction, Ishan. Um, and thank Garwana for inviting me to uh, participate in this excellent uh, program that you have. It's quite exciting. Um, I um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all, and um, I hope you enjoy the talk. Today, I'm going to talk about Sita. Sita has been uh, one of my favorite figures throughout uh, my research, largely because many people construct her in uh, this kind of really very stereotyped fashion. When in fact, what we know from not only Valmiki's Ramayana, but from elsewhere, that she's actually very complex and quite interesting. So I wanna explore her a bit today with you in uh, her various manifestations here. Um, the title, Did Sita Sing the 
uh, blues, you'll probably uh, understand if you haven't seen the actual video of that, you'll understand more towards the end. Um, but this is really a kind of a question and kind of a understanding at what point can we understand Sita to be basically Sita? You know, what is Sita and who is Sita? And at what point does she not represent what we understand to be kind of the traditional Sita? So this is a, a journey through time, Sita seeing the blues. And I'm gonna start with, um, now um, I'm not going to read all of the Sanskrit. I put the Sanskrit in the Nagari here for you. And, oh, I haven't shared the screen yet, have I? Let me do that first. Um, I have, uh, wait a second here. You probably didn't see any of that. Um, my shared screen's over here. Sorry, my shared screen is, there it is. Sorry. Uh, there we go. I, I, I won't take the time to read all of the Sanskrit. This is, of course, a very well known quote from the um, Adhyatma Ramayana, Ramayanani Bahushaha Shrutani Bahubir Vijayi, Sitam Bina Banam Ramo Gataha Kim Kutra Chitpada. Right? Many Ramayanas are heard by many twice borns, but can anyone name one in which Rama goes to the forest without Sita? Sita, the heroine of the Sanskrit epic tale, the Ramayana, is, as I assume you all know, the wife of the epic's hero, Rama, prince of Ayodhya and the eldest son of King Dasharatha. Although many scholars attribute to her origin, attribute to her origins that date back to the earliest literary records of the Indian subcontinent, it is only with her appearance in the Valmiki Ramayana that her character is fully developed. Here, she is the daughter of King Janaka of Matila and the dutiful wife of Rama, who together with her brother-in-law Lakshmana follows her husband into exile. The symbol of wifely devotion and sacrifice in the Hindu consciousness, Sita has continued to serve as a role model for countless generations of women in the Indian subcontinent and the, and the diaspora. The Ramayana of Valmiki is, in all likelihood, the earliest extant version of the story and is the text that has most consistently been examined for its significant impact on the religions, literary, and cultural traditions of South and Southeast Asia. Our work on this epic has led us to narrow down the probable date of the composition of the Valmiki Ramayana to sometime between 750 and 500 BCE. The composer composers of the oldest portions of the poem appear to have been familiar with the Kosala Magadha region at the time of the 16 Janapadas and well before the period from which we can recover verifiable historical data. And yet there are numerous additional versions of the narrative found throughout Indians, the Indian subcontinent and beyond. And each of these presents our heroine and her trials and tribulation in ways that are at once familiar and yet distinctive. These numerous subsequent versions of the Ram Katha render the narrative and the character of Sita in myriad ways. In many, the variations of Sita's characters reflect those seen in ever-changing cultural attitudes toward women. In some, her role is greatly diminished, while in others, both Sanskrit and regional, it is so enhanced that she has become a powerful goddess who defeats a second more powerful form of the demon antagonist, Ravana. Few, however, who know or study the story in the vast majority of its versions would not recognize the epic's heroine, Sita, ex example par excellence of traditional Brahmanical constructions of the of ideal womanhood, a woman totally devoted to her husband, a Pativarata. As laid out in the traditional law books, it was believed that a woman must under the, be under the control of a man for her entire life, her father, her husband, or her son. She must consider her husband as her God and Lord, and she must obey and serve him. Regardless of how much uh, such ideas strike us today, we must remember that these are the attitudes from which the patriarchal world of traditional Hindu society was constructed, and I might have added others as well. While the tradition may prescribe such a moral compass, the Ramayana narrative, especially the version found in Valmiki, framed as it is in the culture of traditional India, depicts Sita as both embodying and contesting these very ideals. 
The two most important roles for women in pre-modern India are wife and mother. And while uh, both take center stage in Valmiki's epic with respect to Sita, it is her wifehood on which the narrative is primarily focused. The Balakanda of the Ramayana expends its energy telling of the birth and childhood adventures of the hero Rama, concluding with his marriage to Sita. We know virtually nothing of Sita until the end, near the end of the first book, when the sage Vishwamitra, mentor and guide to Rama, arrives with the young prince and his brother in Mithila, the capital city of Janaka, who is Sita's father. Janaka offers to show the boys a very special bow, that of the god Shiva. First, however, he tells them about his daughter, Sita. Once, during a sacrifice, um, once during a sacrifice, a girl sprang up from the earth. Since she had appeared um, as Janaka was plowing the sacrificial ground, he called her Sita, furrow. Janaka places a very high bride price um, I'm sorry, uh, on her. She was only to be given to one of great strength. As a test of strength, Jenica offered his daughter to any who could lift the bow and string Shiva's bow. Many kings tried, but none succeeded. Rama, though still young, lifts the bow, strings it, fits it with an arrow, and draws it back. But in doing so, he breaks it, clearly demonstrating his superhuman strength. And this is a picture, you can see this is a cool picture, of here he is stringing the bow and this is what has been brought up and he strings it and he lifts it. We have not seen or heard um, Sita prior to this contest and there's no physical description of her. Even during the wedding preparations, the most central rites of the woman, Sita is largely absent. Um, and there is a marked erasure of virtually all women from the festivities. All right, and here we have this um, wedding ceremony of Sita. The wedding ceremony itself is only briefly described and marks the first appearance of Sita in the epic. Upon uh, the completion- I'm Sorry, so sorry yeah. to interrupt. I think we can see the, uh, we, we see the word document in place of the PowerPoint. So, you are? Yeah. Oh dear. There we go. Click on the I did. Now you can see the PowerPoint? Yes, yes, we can now see the PowerPoint. So this is, yeah. Sorry. So this is a, a Monday picture from Himachal Pradesh of the wedding. Here, of course, you see many women in the, in the whole kind of traditional presentation, but in Valmiki, it is not in such a case, right? The wedding ceremony itself is only briefly described, only briefly described, marks the appearance of Sita in the epic. Upon completion of the ceremony of the sacred wedding thread, Rama takes Sita's hand, and then according to the ritual injunction, the couple takes three steps around the sacrificial fire. Those familiar with the modern Hindu wedding ceremonies uh, will note the similarity of these important elements, the wedding thread ceremony, the groom's taking of the bride's hand, and the circumambulation of the sacred fire. The number of steps, however, is three, and not the expected seven of the present day rite. And at the end of the ceremony, Sita is given lavish gifts by her father, another current practice. At the close of the book, we learn of the flowering love between the newlyweds of Sita's virtue, beauty, and most especially her deep and fully reciprocated love for her husband. I lost them. What? I couldn't even get on, so. We're not, I'm just, they like the recording start. We're not, we got disconnected. Well, I couldn't get any audio. <sighs> Either way, <laughs> my couldn't work the speakers anymore. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I couldn't get, I had to take my other speakers off. So let me get back up here and see if I can get back on the Zoom link. Well, I don't know what is gonna happen now. Okay, so much for that. Um, Are you off computer? Mm -hmm. It's good. 
really bad. I'm just trying to number these things so we don't get in any of this kind of trouble. Mm -hmm. This is a big deal. Everybody does it because that's what we screwed up. What's going on here? The BJP attacks the place. It's just not letting me on anywhere. I'm not getting any zoom length. It's length is dead. Let's we'll see what happened in mine. Oh, there he is. There he is. What happened? You're, you're audible, ma'am, now. Yeah, what happened? There was some, I think there's some glitch, uh, but you, you can continue, I think. Um, from where? <laughs> um, can you can you start from the uh, the wedding scene of Ram and Sita? Um, slide six, I think. Slide six. Okay. I think that slides. Uh, okay. Here we go. So this is slide six, yeah. So we have not seen or heard um, there uh, Sita, uh, prior to this contest and there's been no physical description of her even during the wedding preparations. The most uh, sinful right for a woman, Sita is largely absent. There is, and are you, am I on, is the PD, I'm mean, sorry, is the uh, slideshow up okay? The share screen? Yes, uh, yes, it's, it's perfect. Okay, I'm sorry. I just wanted to double check. Right, upon completion of the ceremony of the sacred wedding fit, Rama takes Sita's hand and then according to ritual injunctions, the couple takes three steps around the sacrificial fire. Those familiar with modern Hindu wedding ceremonies will note the similarity of these important elements. The wedding thread uh, ceremony, the groom's taking of the bride's hand and the circumambulation of the sacred fire. The number of steps, however, is three and not the expected seven of the present day rite. At the end of the ceremony, this uh, Sita is given lavish gifts by her father, another common uh, current practice. Here is a modern version of this, a modern poster art version of the wedding ceremony. At the close of the book, we learn, uh, book, we learn of the flowering of love between the newly reds and uh, of Sita as virtue, beauty, and most especially her deep and recipro fully reciprocated love for her husband. Valmiki thus establishes his heroine, providing her with an impeccable pedigree and all the virtues of a perfect wife. While Valmiki spends little energy on either the story of Sita's birth or her marriage, numerous subsequent versions have expanded and developed these two episodes significantly. The birth of Sita has perhaps given rise to the largest number of variations. While Valmiki provides only a brief account of origins, other versions tend to provide more elaborate and in some cases alternative explanations, generally retaining only Janika's finding her while performing the sacrifice. This episode, as is, it is basically known to Valmiki, is found in a number of later sectarian religions texts called Puranas, but some uncomfortable with Sita's lacking a mother figure provide one. Thus, a later Purana devoted to the worship of the goddess has the earth goddess giving Sita to Janaka during the plowing. The Eastern recension of the Valmiki Ramayana introduces the Apsuras Menaka as her mother, a variant also seen in the 14th century Assamese version of the story. 
A third century Jain Prakrit version makes Sita the natural daughter of Janaka and his wife Videha, a motif also seen in the Kannada version dating from the late 11th century. A Buddhist Jataka version has Dasharatha as her natural father. A fascinating and popular variant has Mandodari, Ravana's chief queen, as Sita's natural mother, or both Mandodari and Ravana as her natural parents. The earliest known version of this variant is found in the early Jain Prakrit version. Here, Mandodari and Ravana are told that their eldest offspring will destroy their family. Mandodari gives birth to Sita, who is put in a box, which is placed where Janaka, plowing a field, discovers it. A common enhancement of this motif of placing Sita in a box found throughout South and Southeast Asia is the setting the box adrift in a river or an ocean. A Telugu version tells us that Sita was born in a lotus in Ravana's garden and then put in a box, which is set adrift. In a Bengali version, Mandodari becomes pregnant, but astrologers predict that the child will destroy Lanka, the capital city of the demons. Mandodari gives uh, birth to an egg, which is placed in a golden chest and thrown into the ocean. The chest is found and taken to uh, Janaka, who, will op who opens it and finds a girl. The box motif is also a favorite in Southeast Asia. Thus, in the Malay and Leo versions, it is a gold casket that is set on a raft. And in the Thai version, she is placed in a glass urn and thrown into the ocean. And in the Burmese version, the box is iron. A later Sanskrit version of the Ramayana narrates a unique version of Sita's birth. Ravana demands drops of blood from the four seers. He puts the blood in a pot and gives it to Mandodari, telling her that it is poison. Mandodari, thinking Ravana unfaithful, drinks it in order to end her life. The potion is not poisonous, but rather infused with the essence of the goddess Lakshmi. Mandodari immediately becomes pregnant and gives birth to a girl whom she buries in a field. Like the birth of Sita, later versions of the Ramayana develop and expand the brief and unromantic marriage ceremony found in Valmiki. For Valmiki, the marriage is clearly a royal alliance and any premarital meeting between the young couple is avoided. Over time, this has changed. Right. Uh, the 8th century Sanskrit playwright Bhagavati introduces just such an element, allowing Rama and Sita to meet before the breaking of the bow. This romantic interlude is found and developed in some of the best known and widely dispersed subsequent versions of the story. Thus, we see a premarital meeting in the Ramayana of the Tamil poet Kampan, as well as the later Sanskrit works. The popular and influential North Indian Ramayana of Tulsi Das, Ramcharitmanas, includes and greatly expands the motif, having the couple meet in a garden before the lifting of the bow. In modernity, in modernity, the popularity of the garden meeting is evidenced by the attention it is given in modern screen versions of the Ramayana, in particular in the 1980s TV serialization of the story. Book two, the Ayodhya Kanda. Um, tells of the court intrigue in Ayodhya, the capital city of Rama's father, and the exile of Rama's exile for 14 years to the forest. We encounter Sita only when Rama goes to her, apartment to, goes to her apartments to inform her of his impending exile. He orders her to remain in Ayodhya, but her reaction is strong and immediate, and somewhat at odds with those of a Pativrata. Before she even speaks, we are told that she is angry. At first, her words reflect her traditional understanding of wifehood. Her husband is her lord. She must follow his footsteps and share in his reversal of fortunes. However, her very resistance to remaining behind contradicts her husband's desires. Rama is still unwilling to take her, and Sita, in her bitter sorrow at his repeated refusals, responds in words that can only be described as harsh and demanding. Finally, she threatens suicide if, her, if he refuses to take her. Rama still refuses. Change her, her tactics, tactics, Sita reviles him. And she says to him, what could my father, Vaideha, have had in mind when he took you for a son-in-law, Rama, a woman in the body of a man? Rama finally relents. 
Few epic women are allowed such strong and abusive voice. And while Miki has carefully crafted the passage to allow Sita to speak them under very specific circumstances, that is when her status as an ideal wife is challenged. While Miki depicts Sita's public persona far differently, emphasizing her devotion as well as her youth, her position and her shyness. She has been kept isolated and protected in the confines of the women's quarters. She is innocent and pampered, unused to the harshness of the outside world. This is highlighted during their leave taking from Ayodhya, when Sita seeks her husband's assistance as she tries to put on the harsh bark cloaked garments of exile. The scene eliciting the pathos of generations of Ramayana audience is still among the most frequently depicted in dance. <clears throat> The, and the visual arts. Once Sita reaches the forest, our opportunities to see and hear her increase, while simultaneously we find her far more vulnerable to a myriad dangers. It is here in the Aranyakan that, that the most central event of the epic occurs. Here, the heroine is abducted by Ravana, the overlord of the Rakshasas, and taken to the island fortress of Lanka. The events of the abduction of Sita, the Sita uh, Paharana, are well known, but Sita's role in them provides further insights into the complexity of her character. Sita, spying a lovely golden deer, becomes infatuated and desires to fetch it for her. And, Rama, uh, and desires Rama to fetch it for her. Lakshmana, suspicious that the deer is illusory, tries to dissuade him. Rama departs, arguing that either the deer will provide Sita a delightful hide, or if the deer is truly the Rakshasa Maricha in disguise, he ought to kill him. Lakshmana reminds, uh, remains to guard Sita. Rama eventually finds and kills the demon. This is a nice cave image of uh, the scene here with this is Rama slain and here's his bow and he's slaying the golden deer here. See, to spying a lovely golden deer becomes infatuated. Okay, right. Uh, Rama departs, arguing that either the deer will provide Sita a delightful hide, or if the deer is truly the Rakshas of Aricha in disguise, he ought to kill him. Lakshmana remains to guard Sita. Ravan, Rama eventually finds and kills the demon. Maricha in the throes of death cries out in Rama's voice. Hearing the call of distress, Sita begs Lakshmana to go to Rama's aid. Lakshmana refuses and Sita in anger lashes out at him. She accuses Lakshmana of lacking any affection for Rama and wishing for his elder brother's demise. Lakshmana is so offended by Sita's accusation that he curses her and makes some disparaging remarks on the nature of women. Finally, he agrees to go, but not without warning her of the ominous portents that have appeared. Nonetheless, Sita, in an even more vicious manner, continues her assault on his character, finally accusing Lakshman of the unthinkable. Excellent. I'm Kelly. You, right. And he says, you treacherously followed Rama to the forest, the two of you alone. You are either in the employ of Partha or you're secretly plotting to get me. These are the words are the cruelest of all, for by accusing Lakshmana both of plotting with Rama's and Lakshmana's brother Bharata, whom she implies is Rama's rival against, uh, against Rama and having secret designs on her, Sita questions Lakshmana's abiding quality, his unwavering devotion to his elder brother. Her words, similar in intensity to those she utters to Rama in the Ayodhya Khand, is similar in with a threat to kill herself. Lakshmana, unable to withstand her harsh accusations, acquiesces to her demands and departs in search of Rama. Sita's behavior, both her, uh, both her infatuation with the illusory deer and her demand expressed in such cruel and harsh words set the sage for her abduction. Sita now uh, alone is now approached by Ravana who has taken on the guise of a mendicant. Once again, deluded by illusory powers, this time Ravana Sita greets him with the honor due a revered elder. Ravana at first maintains his disguise, but shortly begins to seduce Sita. Finally, Ravana reveals his true nature and purpose to her. He desires her as his wife. Sita, although frightened, swears on her undying fidelity to Rama. 
Fiercely rejecting the demon's advances, she engages in a spirit and condescending verbal attack on his character and a heartfelt defense of Rama's valor and power. Sita's rebuff enrages Ravana and he abducts her. This is, of course, the very famous scene. With his left hand, he seizes Sita by her hair and with his right hand by her thighs. It is with this scene that we see Sita's first encounter with a male outside the family. Sita's defense and resistance, however, are not physical. She is not able to defend herself against such assaults, but rather verbal. Threatened by Ravana, she once again demonstrates the power of both her voice and her devotion. And here's uh, another scene. This one is, uh, this is the abduction right here. Uh, as she's carried up into the sky by the rocks, so we hear Sita first calling out Rama, but she is heard only by the vulture Jatayus who tries to aid her and by the monkeys. Later in the book, we hear once more from Sita, when Ravana, having taken her to his palace in Lanka, attempts again to seduce her. Sita now, in place, uh, Sita now placing a piece of straw between her and Ravana, an action she repeats in the Sundarakanda, praises the glory and power of Rama and foretells, the and, uh, foretells Ravana's downfall. And she says to him, a pariah, a chandala, cannot desecrate an altar in the place of sacrifice, equipped with ladles and other utensils, and sanctified by the hymns of Brahmins. This body of mine has no more feeling. Throw it in the chains or have it killed. I care nothing about preserving it, or my life either, Rakshasa. I will not disgrace myself in the eyes of the world. Here we see Sita's body compared to the ancient spire uh, sacrifice, which stands at the symbolic center of the Brahmanical world, and Ravana compared to a chandala. Like her own body, the destruction of the sacrifice is preferable to defilement. The scene ends with Ravana allotting 12 months, the time remaining of Rama's exile, for Sita to submit to him or face having Ravana's cook chop her up into minced meat for my breakfast. Upon his departure, Ravana orders hideous and horrifying Rakshasa women to guard Sita. Thus, a pattern has emerged wherein Valmiki has Sita defend her husband as well as the patriarch of, to the outside world. However, alone and seemingly abandoned, we will see that Sita's words challenge her husband and societal norms that he represents. The centrality of this episode of the narrative is likewise seen in the vast majority of other versions uh, of the Ramayana. Most variants retain both Sita's inability to recognize the illusory magic of the Rakshasas uh, and her fierce attack on Lakshmana found in Valmiki. An extremely popular innovation has Lakshmana, before leaving to search for Rama, draw a magical circle around Sita. As long as she stays within the circle, she is safe. But once she leaves it, she becomes vulnerable. This line, popularly called Lakshmana's magic circle, or the Lakshman Reka, is known to a number of versions of the tale from at least the 14th century, where it is found in the Adhyatma, uh, I'm sorry, the Adbhuta Ramayana and the Bushumdi Ramayana, and the Kotanese version of the story. While the Ramayana of Tulsidas has the motif, it is not found in the Aranyakanda, but rather in its sixth book. The motif has widespread, is widespread in Southeast Asian versions as well, where it is seen in such texts as the Malay Hikayat Sariram. The innovation is so popular that in India, the phrase Lakshman Reka is used idiomatically to mean a convention or rule that must not be violated. One of the most emotionally wrought scenes of the epic is the abduction of Sita. In Valmiki, Ravana physically assaults Sita, coming into direct contact with her body. Such physical contact as, as, well, as, um, uh, as well as the thought that Sita resides in the, gar in the um, Antahapuram or the garden of Ravana's Antahapuram is clearly uncomfortable for many audiences and numerous variations evolve to avoid any suggestion of either. The best known of these modifications is what is commonly called the illusory Sita, the Chaya Sita or Maya Sita. Here, a simulacrum of Sita is created, which is then abducted by Ravana. The real Sita spends the duration of the exile in heaven or hidden from in the sacred fire. During the Agni Pariksha, the trial by fire later in the epic, the real Sita once again 
replaces the Simaculum. Um, thus, the real Sita is never touched by Ravana, nor does she dwell in her, uh, his palace or undergo a fire ordeal. Other versions similarly, similarly avoid physical contact. A uh, popular motif to avoid contact has Ravana picking up of the ground on which Sita stands. This is sometimes expanded to include the hut or Sita, as for example, in the Tamil and Kampan Ramayana and a number of Southeast Asia versions. Once abducted and confined within the walls of Ravana's palace, Sita, though constantly in Rama's thoughts and frequently mentioned in the con conversations of others, does not actively participate in the epic until Hanuman discovers her in Lanka. In other words, we do not hear from her or see her again until book five, the Sundarakanda. The events of this book occur in Lanka, specifically in the Ashoka Grove attached to the Antahapuram of Ravana's palace. Here Valmiki both invokes the sympathy or other reactions of his audience towards the forlorn, helpless heroine and creates a situation wherein the heroine's voice is heard at great length. Because of her captivity, Sita must act in ways not often allowed women in patriarchal discourse. She must make her own decisions, interact with males outside of the family and defend her husband as well as her own virtue. Much of the Sundarakanda is spent in either describing Sita or hearing Sita. The poet takes us from the depths of Sita's despair to her realization that Rama will rescue her, painting a nuanced and vivid picture of the epic's heroine. We see repeated, developed, and intensified many of the traits that the poet has already associated with her. He does this both evoking very uh, usual, uh, visual images of Sita, which are projected through the eyes of the monkey Hanuman, Ravana, and the poet as well as letting us hear Sita uh, as she interacts first with Ravana and the Rakshas wardresses, and then with Hanuman, and finally, as she contemplates her own situation. Before Hanuman, who has been dispatched, dispatched to search for the abducted princess, uh, even finds her, we are given a detailed, highly eroticized description of Lanka, Ravana's palace, its inhabitants, specifically the women of his harem and the grove where Sita has resided during her captivity. Once Hanuman reaches the Ashoka Grove and prior to his discovery of the princess, Hanuman reflecting to himself reminds us of her beauty and her intense devotion to Rama, as well as her love for the forest life and its creatures. He anticipates that Sita will come to the nearby stream in time to perform her evening rituals, drawing our attention to the fact that she is a deeply religious woman. The description of Sita as Hanuman first glimpses her in the Ashoka um, Grove is one of the most poetic and emotionally wrought passages of the epic. And here we have, this is describing what Hanuman sees. Then he saw a woman clad in a soiled garment and surrounded by a rakshasa woman. She was gaunt with fasting. She was dejected and she sighed repeatedly. She looked like the shining sliver of the waxing moon. Her radiance was lovely, but her beauty now only faintly discernible. She resembled a flame of fire occluded by thick smoke. The poet carefully sets in juxtaposition the contrast. A once finely clothed and ornamented woman is now garbed in soiled clothing and gaunt. Her beauty is still discernible, but barely. The poet continues to develop the pathos of the passage, finally comparing Sita to the most important markers of the preservation of traditional Brahmanic culture its scriptures. As he examined Sita closely, Hanuman's mind was once more afflicted with uncertainty, for she seemed barely discernible, like some sacred Vedic text once learned by heart, but now nearly lost through lack of recitation. The elaborate and lengthy descriptions of Sita as delicate, beautiful, forlorn, alone, devoted to Rama, pious, and ascetic stand in stark contrast to that of the enchanting romantic beauty of the garden and the inner apartments recently described by the poet. The images used to describe Sita are a, a different resonance and temper than those uh, seen earlier. Many of the similes focus on asceticism, fire and smoke, perhaps intended to be reminiscent of the ritual fire memory, faith, hope, intellect, and the like. These types of images are not typically associated with women or beauty, 
And the tone and choice of the descriptors can be seen in part as a device to reassure the audience of Sita's chastity, chastity and her other utter devotion to Rama. At this point in the narrative, Ravana is introduced, still intent on seducing the lovely Sita. The poet through Hanuman's eyes describes the king of the Rakshas in terms that emphasize his sexual nature and Sita Ravana sees only a sexualized object. But as for Ravana, in his urgent desire to see that fair-hipped woman with her black hair, her full breasts crowding one another and her dark, darting eyes, he advanced toward her. This highly eroticized picture is immediately countered by yet another chapter-long description of Sita, which highlights once again her blamelessness, isolation, ascetic mean, devotion to Rama, and misery. Through yet another series of highly descriptive similes, some reflective of earlier ones, others entirely new, Valmiki evokes the pathos of Sita's condition. Again, a number of these figures map onto the ancient Brahmanic tradition the sacrifice, and sacrifice onto her, reinforcing that the danger is not just to Sita, but to an entire way of life as the poet envisions it. Finally, Ravana departs after repeating his threat that if she does not willing come, willingly come to his bed within two months, he will have, have her served for his breakfast. Alone, except for the disfigured Rakshas of women who are ordered to guard her, Sita begins to lament. Unlike her spirited defense of her husband in her confrontation with Ravana, we now are presented with a woman filled with self-doubts about her future. Alone and abandoned, Sita gives up all hope of rescue and resolves to end her life. Depressed, forlorn, she concludes that her husband, beloved husband, has been killed or has found another woman with whom to make love. Unable to procure poison or a weapon, Sita finally decides to hang herself with her long black braid. It is in the, uh, it is in the poet's description of this remarkable passage that we finally discover the emotional complexity, intensity, and depth of our heroine. Here we see no stereotypical woman, but a nuanced depiction of a woman, both faithful to a husband, defensive of her world, but still subjected to self-doubt and introspection. At this most critical juncture of the narrative, Hanuman reinserts himself into the narrative. Hanuman reveals his presence and eventually convinces Sita, who originally thinks he is a Rakshas in disguise, that he is Rama's messenger, offering his, him her as proof the token ring that Rama had given him, given her. And he says this very famous word, taking her husband's ring and examining it. Sita was as joyous as if she had rejoined her husband. This verse, considered one of the most important of the epic, marks the moment that the downward spiral of tragic events that we have ha that have haunted the couple reverses its course. Hanuman, in yet another iconic moment of the epic, offers to carry Sita back. She refuses his offer, first questioning his ability to do so as he is a mere monkey, and then offering a number of additional excuses. The most famous of which is that he would not willingly uh, she would not willingly touch another male's body. Sita gives Hanuman her hair ornament to give to Rama and Hanuman leaves her. The encounter between Hanuman and Sita offers yet another window into this complex heroine. With, heroine. with Hanuman's arrival, we first encounter a skeptical and defensive woman, one wary of the illusory powers of the Rakshasas. Ironically, what Sita as first understands here is illusory, a talking monkey, is in fact real. The episode is the inverse of that in the forest, where both the golden deer and Ravana in the guise of the ascetic appear to her real, but are illusory. Once convinced that there is hope of her rescue, Sita is depicted as articulate, insightful, and virtuous. Additionally, the poet describes for us a woman who is given, used to giving orders. First, she insults Hanuman, rejecting his plans for her, her rescue, and then she tells him what he must do. Thus, it is only in the Sundara Khanda that the full depth and complexity of our heroine's character is manifested. Balmiki has carefully constructed this book to allow us a varied optic of his heroine, providing us a rare opportunity to explore a full range of human emotions through her. 
The next book, the Yudha Khanda, relates a long and fierce battle between Rama and his monkey troops and Ravana and his Rakshasa armies. It is a book about male aggression and revenge and rarely allows for space for other concerns. Nevertheless, as the object of that aggression, Sita looms large in the book, although she rarely appears or speaks in it. The first encounter we have with Sita is early in the book where Ravana, using his illusory powers, attempts to delude Sita into thinking that Ram has been killed. He tells her an elaborate but fabricated story of how his army has defeated Rama's troops in the night and shows her Rama's bow and head's severed head, both illusory. Believing the real illusion, Sita laments the loss of her beloved and wishes for her own death again. Ramana is summoned away and he depart, as he departs, the illusory head and sword disappear. The passage reminds us once again of how susceptible Sita is to the illusory magic of the Rakshasas. <laughs> Sita appears again only uh, at the end of the book in what perhaps is one of the most controversial moments of the epic. After the culminating battle of the book, the duel between Rama and Ravana, in which the Rakshasa overlord the slaying. Rama orders Sita to be brought to, um, into, to full, um, brought to him in full view of the assembled court, much to the queen's humiliation and embarrassment. This reunion between Rama and Sita is anything but happy. Rama claiming that he only undertook his, this mission to avenge the insult to him and his family, and he rejects her. saying, since, however, your virtue is now in doubt, your presence has become as profoundly disagreeable to me as is a bright lamp to a man afflicted with eye disease. Go therefore, as you please, daughter of Jenica, you have my permission. Here are the 10 directions. I have no further use uh, for you, my good woman. Regardless of Sita's devotion to her lord, her abduction by Ravan and her period of captivity in the residence of the Rakshasa Lord has rendered her polluted, unfit as a wife for Rama. For as he cruelly reminds her, what man of good family would take back again a woman who has lived in another man's home? How can I, boasting of my great lineage, take you back after you have sat on Ravana's lap and have had his lustful gaze upon you? The fear of sexual aggression is so clearly at the forefront of the poets <coughs> and by extension the culture's concerns that even Sita, the most devoted and faithful of wives, cannot escape its net. Thus the harshness of these words is real but not unexpected. Sita, devastated, once again speaks in defense of herself while condemning her husband's behavior. How can you, heroic prince, speak to me with such cutting and improper words? What painful to the ear, as some vulgar man might speak to his vulgar wife. You harbor suspicion against all women because of the conduct of the vulgar ones. If you really knew me, you would abandon your suspicion. If I came into contact with another's body against my well lord, I had no choice in the matter. It was fate that was to blame here. My heart, which I do control, was always devoted to you but I could not control my body, which was in the power of the, another. What could I have done? Oops, is um, sorry, this is like, uh, <coughs> um, Sita then orders Lakshmana to build a pyre as she can no longer bear to live. Lakshmana's first seeking Rama's approval does so. And one of the most poignant moments of the epic, Sita in her final words of the book, swears her fidelity to her Lord and asks for the protection of Agni, the god of fire. She then enters the flames, but is not consumed by them. Agni, the god of fire, assuming human form, takes and taking hold of Sita emerges from the pyre with the princess unharmed and testifies to her purity. Rama finally accepts her, arguing that he knew that Sita was untainted, but even so, she had to be tested. Rama's public rejection of his wife assures the priority of the masculine concerns of the narrative and the patriarchy that it defends. This is a really nice Jaimini Roy 
um, version of the Agni Pariksha here. It's a modern piece. This episode commonly called the trial by fire, the Agni Pariksha has not been universally well received by audiences of the Ramayana. Rather, it has served as a focal point for numerous critiques and counter narratives from early times. These critiques focus on both Rama's treatment of Sita here and later in the last book where he banishes her. The innovation discussed above of the illusory Sita, the Chaya Sita, is one popular mechanism through which the tradition seeks to diffuse the unease caused by Rama's action. Other versions of the story express the discomfort differently. Some admit the trial of uh, by fire, the Agni Pariksha entirely, while others like the uh, Malay Hikayat Seri Rama have seek to undergo an ordeal by fire from which she emerges on her own when the fire has burnt itself out. Once Rama has returned to Ayodhya with Sita and is con consecrated in kingship, the epic returns its attention to the history and lineage of the epic's antagonist, Ravana, giving at least for half of the, uh, the last book, little space for any of the epic's other characters. However, when the narrative's attention once again turns to the concerns of Rama's kingship, Sita emerges as a central, although largely silent figure. Having dealt with the matters of the court, Rama finally turns his attention to his wife. In the Ashoka garden adjacent to their royal apartments, Rama and Sita engage in a romantic moment, at the end of which we are told that Sita displays the auspicious signs of pregnancy. Following this, Rama hears that there are rumors in the city questioning Sita's fidelity. Rama then decides he must abandon her, who is now in the final stages of pregnancy. <clears throat> he orders Rama to take her to the for I'm uh, Lakshmana to take her to the forest under the pretext of fulfilling her own desire to visit the sages and abandon her. Lakshmana does so, and Sita is discovered and rescued by Valmiki, who now appearing as a participant in the story he is telling, who takes um, who takes uh, who gives pr her protection in his own ashram, where she is eventually gives birth to her sons Lava and Kusha. This powerful scene commonly called the abandonment of Sita or the Sita Tyaga is another one of the most controversial moments of the epic. Sita's reactions to her husband's rejection is yet another emotionally powerful moment. Years later, after Rama's two sons have been raised by the epic poet himself, Rama during a performance of the ritual horse sacrifice called the Ashvamedha, hears them sing the story of his own adventures. Rama is so moved by the power of the singing that he's uh, seeking reunion with Sita once again summons her and orders her to take an oath of fidelity. Valmiki leads her in, the, in front of Rama, verifying yet again her purity, but Sita's final act of resistance uses her very oath of fidelity to defy her husband, invoking her mother. She says, as I have never even in thought, uh, I, I've, I've never even thought of any man other than Raghava Rama, so may the goddess Madhavi, the goddess Earth, open wide for me. With these words, her mother, the goddess of Earth, arises from a fissure in the Earth's surface and taking Sita descends once more to her subterranean abode. The Sita, this is a Rabbi Varma version of the episode here, where she's coming down, taking Sita down. The Sita, who had emerged as an infant from the sacrificial ground during her father's sacrifice, re-enters the earth during her husband's. It's Sita's devotion to her husband that provides her very power to resist his wishes and yet remain unwavering in his, her devotion to him. In Sita, Valmiki has created a powerful, complex, and very human character. Her devotion to her lord and husband is real and lies at the heart of Valmiki's portrayal of her and the culture's infatuation with her. But as we have discovered, Valmiki has created a much more complex and nuanced figure, one through whom the epic audience is able to experience a full range of emotions. Nevertheless, she is still a woman, and as such, her purity and fidelity is always in question. Thus, for Valmiki, Sita's final words demonstrate both her unwavering adherence to the cultural ideal of a devoted wife and her resistance to this very construction of womanhood. Like the trial by fire and the abandonment of Sita and its aftermath are deeply disturbing to many audiences, so much so that numerous popular versions omit them altogether. 
Nevertheless, other versions retain these episodes or even expand upon them. Thus, we have the Padma Purana, a, a popular sectarian work in Sanskrit, which devotes a great deal of attention to the day, later days of Rama's career, focusing on and enhancing the role of love and Kusha, the twin sons of Rama and Sita. It is in some of these versions that there is evidenced a growing unease with Valmiki's story. This discomfort is expressed in a number of ways, as in the various renderings. In particular, we find the innovations rationalizing the Sita's abandonment. Among these rationalizations are a curse on Rama and or Sita, Sita as an instigator or cause of her own management, the malicious gossip of a, wish, a washerman, and Sita's drawing of Ravana's poet, um, portrait. While Valmiki himself expresses some discomfort in introducing the idea of a previous curse, some later poets give expression to their unease through a critique of Rama by an elder. The Padma Purana offers several rationalizations. One merely has Rama saying that Sita has abandoned him. Another has Sita blame herself for her banished management. She captures a pair of parrots, which she overhears talking about her future marital joy. They promise to tell Sita's future in full if Sita sets them free once the story is concluded. Sita refuses, vowing instead to keep the pregnant female parrot until the prediction proves true. Separated, the two birds cannot survive. The female dies, cursing Sita to suffer separation from her husband. The male bird drowns himself in the Ganges, vowing to be reborn in Ayodhya as a washerman. The washerman introduced here becomes the voice of gossip concerning Sita and is a popular motif in Eastern Indian versions of the Ramayana as well as the Tibetan version. Another popular and widespread motif similarly places the blame on Sita. Here, Sita, typically urged by other women, draws a picture of Ravana. Rama then discolors the picture and banishes Sita. Similar versions are known to a number of later Jain versions, and this, also, this is also found in some later Sanskrit versions, as well as many regional versions, such as the Bengali, Assamese, Telugu, and Malayalam. This popular motif is also known throughout Southeast Asia and Thailand, Malaysia, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Sri Lanka. In addition to the numerous versions of the Ramayana epic that follow and reinforce the cultural um, dictates articulated by the main narrative, there's a long and continuing history of counter Ramayanas that contest and even subvert these very norms. A large number of these counter Ramayanas focus on Sita, the Sita has become the subject of numerous literary and artistic endeavors, such as the popular focus of feminist scholarship and activism. So popular figure is she that in such alternative narratives that Veena Ryan Rao has questioned at what point does the Sita of these various alternative versions cease to be Sita or the heroine of the Ramayana? Rao's question is an important one. Many modern representations of Sita have been so have been and continue to be extremely controversial. For example, there's Imeth Hussein's paintings of Sita, several of which have caused a great disruption in various showings and effectively forced the artist uh, before his death to go into self-imposed exile in Qatar. And Nina Paley's cartoon film, Sita Sings the Blues, of which this is a representation, the showing which has also given rise to protest. While for many Sita stands as a silent representative of ideal Hindu of wifehood, her voice has and continues to be heard as a powerful index to cultural norms, anxieties, and resistances. Sita then emerges in a modern day as a significant multidimensional and complex marker of womanhood for millions of women throughout the world. She is the devoted and subservient wife of Rama and yet a goddess in her own right. She is the very source of her husband's power. She is the abused wife and the feminist hero. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that wonderful uh, lecture and uh, for, for throwing some light on, on, on Sita. And uh, we have some questions for you in the chat, but uh, I'll just switch. Uh, I'll just switch this. I'll just stop the PowerPoint sharing. I, I'll do that right now. Here, I'll, I'll, oh, you got it. Good. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for that.
powerful and wonderful uh, depiction and an introduction to uh, portrayal of Sita and various uh, various versions of the Ram Katha. And I was making notes throughout. And uh, you mentioned Adbhut Ramayana in the lecture, which is said to have composed by uh, Valmiki, the great sage himself, and also the Yoga Vashishta that he uh, is said to have composed. So in the Adbhut Ramayana, Sita is depicted as Kali. So can you talk about that in, in, in some... I'm not sure I quite got... The... Kali. She's depicted as Kali. Uh, she's depicted as Kali. Yeah, she does her own sort of uh, uh, Where? In Adbhut Ramayana. At, at Booth Ramayana, you mean, where she does that. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't tell you a whole lot about uh, that. Do you know anything about that? Uh, you want to say something about it? Here. Well, yes. It, it, excuse me for butting in, but <laughs> the, uh, the Booth yeah, Ramayana is kind of a shakta text in which Sita is the principal divinity, right? <laughs> she has, uh, she displays her Swarupa just as uh, Bhagavan Krishna does in the Bhagavad Gita. And so as in many of the uh, Eastern uh, Ramayana stories, especially in uh, Bengal and Asham, uh, Sita is a more powerful figure because these are Shakta Ramayana. Yeah, Shakta she Ramayana, is a, yeah. a figure of the goddess. So as Kali, of course, or Durga, but uh, she's often the, the power behind Rama in many of these uh, episodes. But uh, this, this is a particular feature of the uh, Eastern, of, yes. Of Eastern, uh, mm -hmm. yes, uh, of Eastern Ramayas and Adbhut Ramayas. And Adbhut, yeah, sorry. Uh, I didn't quite get the question. Many are ascribed to Valmiki, but whether they were written by Valmiki. Yeah, I mean, the way, lots, of, lots of things are ascribed to Valmiki, right? So. Um... Thank you so much, uh, 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 sir and ma'am. Uh, another facet that I think is quite fascinating is in the Dasharatha Jataka, uh, the, the, uh, both Ram and Sita are shown as siblings and uh, there's no mention. It is one, one of those rare versions of Ram Katha where you do not find the mention of the episode of the abduction of Sita. Um, so do we get any other references or absentees of this kind of episode? I only know that in the Dasa uh, Ratha Jataka, I mean, where they're the brother and the sister. Yeah, that's that's the version. And, you know, that's addressing a different concern. You know, I mean, it's it's taking the names, but it's not, it's just, uh, you know, it has it has different agenda. So, you know, the, the, the need, I mean, the ability to have them as siblings is not any way culturally, un, you know, improper in a sense. Right, because it has a, a different purpose. Uh, my next question, how does uh, gender affect our reading and interpretation of text, especially uh, epic and uh, Mahakavya like uh, Ramayana? Oh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very large question. How does gender affect it? Well, you know, it, it, one of the things that, I mean, you, it gender, I mean, it depends, you know, what you mean by gender, who you're talking about, what the, you know, implications gender, you know, can be read in multiple ways. I mean, and one of the things I think that, you know, I mean, this actually has a little bit more to do with Mahabharata in some ways than Ramayana, but one of the things I think that's really important for us to realize is that gender is not always marked the same way, not only in various texts, but in various cultures. And, and, and how we think of, you know, body and gender and identity, you know, it has to be, you know, uh, I think we need to expand our acceptance of what those terms mean and how they work. So for example, I'm just thinking in the, um, you know, in the, I mean, there are many examples in the, in the Mahabharata, but I was just thinking particularly of the, of the case of uh, the ascetic woman, Sulabha, who, yes, I know you were thinking I was going to say almost anybody else, but Sulabha is an ascetic woman and she's actually, you know, uh, this, this figure who really contests 
physical space and, and gender in terms of, uh, you know, and what constitutes body. And I mean, and I mean, I think that figures like that really make, should, I mean, we can learn from those kinds of stories how we need to appreciate what it means to be, you know, marked by, you know, gender. And when you do it in, particularly in, um, you know, binary terms, I think that it is, it, it's, it does a disservice. So I, one of the things I like to do when I read a text is to try to open up my mind to as many different, you know, like possibilities of how, how not only am I receiving the text, but how, how can we understand how the audience received the text and how can we, what can we find about the author in terms of what he was understanding? So in VCB specifically the Ramayana, one of the things that I've noticed is that Valmiki actually uses the structure of his narrative, actually how he constructs his narrative and where he puts certain episodes to articulate his feelings about gender, particularly about women in this case. Uh, and he does it very specifically, and he uses the actual physical structure of the epic and the kandas to do that. Um, I actually wrote an article on that, so I, I'm not going to go into it now. But so, I mean, what I'd like to do is to try to see these kinds of patterns in text to help us understand more. I mean, so there you have narrative, actually, the construction of the narrative gives us insight into the text. I mean, the, I, literally the physical placement of episodes. Right, as opposed to, you know, like what the episodes say. So, I mean, I think those kinds of ways, you know, can really help us kind of expand our understanding of gender and attitudes towards gender. Um, also, I think one of the things we have to understand, particularly with <coughs> Sanskrit, Sanskrit has this, you know, very intense gendered basis to it. So we always have to kind of like, we're always being pushed into a prism of the actual language forcing the gender in many ways. So the words chosen are gendered and they frequently, um, much more so I think than in, in most modern languages. Thank you so much ma'am for that. And uh, uh, in India, in the place where I live, the Northern part of the subcontinent, there are two versions of, out of 300 or more versions that is available of the Ram, but the two, dominant narratives is one is the uh, Sanskrit Valmiki Ramayana and another is the Tulsi Das's Avadhi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you place Sita in both these if you can compare uh, the character of Sita in both these uh, tellings of well, this? I, mean, I, I think I mean there's a, I think most people uh, in certainly in modernity, you know, especially in the north, you get this kind of the people who are mostly familiar with Ram Chakmanas tend to have a much more stereotyped notion of both of all of the characters. And they also associate them much more uh, directly with divinity, right? Uh, Valmiki tends to, I mean, uh, you know, we would argue that, you know, Valmiki understands, especially Rama to be avatara. But a lot of people have argued against that. But we we feel that it's it's more an occluded or kind of a hidden divinity. In other words, divinity is there, but it's not overt in the text. Mm -hmm. What? Boon of yeah, because of the boon of Ravana. Right. So um, that he cannot be killed by anyone, right? But he leaves out, of course, human, and he leaves out the animals. So that's why though you have the monkeys and you have Rama. Um, born to kill him. So, but uh, people come, you know, uh, who are familiar with particularly Ram Charitmanas tend to see Sita as this perfect lady, as this perfect woman, this ideal. And this is the woman gets transformed into, you know, and to, I think, and in, in kind of like superimposed on a lot of uh, the, uh, you know, constructions of women in modernity. And I've always been arguing that, you know, that Valmiki, that's one of the points of this, is that Valmiki and other versions depict this much more complex and more interesting figure and a much more a figure that, you know, as a human, you can relate to. I mean, more so actually than in many ways Valmiki, I mean, the Rama, I mean, Sita has a much more kind of nuanced 
presentation in, in terms of her emotional, you know, kind of joys and her depths of despair and her articulations of just, you know, feelings that we would all have. And I mean, I think that, uh, but most people don't know Valmiki that well. I mean, they think they know Valmiki, but unless you've literally read Valmiki, you don't know it that well, right? Um, and most people know, you know, these, these kind of either modern versions or the um, TV versions or cartoon versions or, you know, what, you know, their family versions. Many people, have, you know, tell the story in their family. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, Valmiki is, is um, I, would, I would argue in many ways, probably far more nuanced than almost any of the other versions. I mean, her uh, character for her at least. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I, you were talking about the divinity and the divine uh, status mm -hmm. of Sita. Uh, there's this particular uh, Bengali uh, retelling called the Chandrabhati uh, Ramayana, mm -hmm. where we see that uh, the poet, Bengali poet Chandrabhati is actually uh, giving Sita a divine status, but at the same time also seeing her as a woman in, in yes. society. So raising questions and problems of being a woman in a society. Uh, so I think that's an interesting- yeah, that's, that's the value of someone like Sita. I mean, there's so many ways that Sita is presented throughout the subcontinent and in the diaspora that she is, you know, allowed to be used in, I mean, you know, to help women, you know, like cope with their lives in many ways and for a lot of these versions. Uh, Yes, uh, we have some questions for you in the chat, so I'll read them out for you. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a question by Krishnakant Lahangi. This question is in contemporary deconstruction, Sita has been appropriated by discourses on the right kind of feminist, one who, yeah. unlike Draupadi, does not demand her rights and uh, viciously get her way at any cost, but rather practices stoic reserve and uh, resignation like Sita. But is that the only way to look at Sita in present context? I agree that she has been co-opted. Uh, I mean, actually, if you think about it, the various traditions over the years have kind of taken and used her and Rama too, as uh, you know, to, to kind of as a symbol of what and you know manipulated these figures because they're so popular and they're so influential to to help their own goals. Um, I, you know, uh, I, you know, I think that the best thing that people can do wherever is to learn as much as you can about as much of, you know, is like read the text, learn Sanskrit, right? <laughs> Study Sanskrit, learn, read the text, and you'll understand the kind of, you know, the kind of depth of these uh, figures in the original and there's something to you have knowledge to kind of counter these you know co-options of these figures um but don't forget i mean valmiki is our earliest extant version of the story but we're not even certain that it's the oldest version of the story it's just the earliest one we have a record of so uh, we have to remember you know we are not sure exactly you know i mean we, we don't have an original ramayana right in that way. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, there's another interesting question by Revantika Gupta. Uh, Dr. Goldman, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. Would love to hear your thoughts on Nina Pele's film, Some More, and the <laughs> way in which you think it responds to and subverts Valmiki's version of the Mahakabya. Oh, yes, Nina Pele's version. I'm, you know, um, what can I say? I, I am. I don't think it's a Ramayana, how's that? I mean, I think she has done some very clever things. I think some of the animation and some of the music is very clever, uh, but I, I, I'm hard pressed to understand. I mean, that's what I was talking about when I was mentioning at the end of Narayana Rao, you know, at what point is Sita no longer Sita? You know, that's just, that's not Sita finally in some ways. I mean, that figure that she's presenting is just not what I, you know, culturally construct in my brain anyway when I think of all the reminders I know that's kind of like outside so I mean I appreciate her cleverness in having created that and using it I don't think I would identify it as a Ramayana 
And I mean, and that's why I put it at the very end. And that's why I titled the papers I titled it, right? You know, um, she did, Sita did sing a few blues here and there in the Sundarakanda, but not quite like that. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that. Uh... I do not see any more questions, but there's this uh, question. Isn't this, isn't it only the perspective whether Sita sings the blues or not? <laughs> Is it, I mean, you know, I mean, I was just, I, I was just using that because it seemed like a fun title, but <laughs> I mean, I, um, as I was saying, I mean, you know, I mean, Sita, you know, actually, says a lot of things besides the blues, but she, I mean, in the Sundarakanda, you have to say that she definitely is, is doing what we would understand in some ways is to, you know, kind of moan and uh, feel badly for herself about her predicament. And, you know, so singing the blues in a sense, but in general, um, uh, you know, I, I use that because I felt that, you know, that, we have to really question what is Ramayana, what is Sita, what is Rama, you know, and what point can we allow, you know, that do we, at what point do these names trigger certain kinds of emotional responses? And at what point can we say they're really Ramayana? They clearly trigger emotional responses because that just the, you know, like the, you know, depth and breadth of cultural uh, history that comes with the names themselves. But is that Ramayana if you use, I mean, if you have a poem with the name Urmila in it, does that mean it's about the Ramayana? Uh, you know, I mean, at what point do we not, you know, so just because Sita singing the blues, is that really the Ramayana? No. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goldman for taking out so much time to deliver this lecture this uh, evening for you and morning for us and uh, uh, we had a great audience uh, today and uh, it was truly an honor learning about uh, a character like uh, Sita, who is very interesting in all these retellings. I have read two retellings, but uh, I would love to explore more, especially the folk retellings in India, you know, different. Uh, oh, there's so many. Yeah, there's and there's a lot of work out there on these various retellings. So it's, it's very it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Yes. And before we end uh, today's session, I would uh, I would uh, just mention the upcoming lectures that we have lined up for our audience. And we would request all of you to just subscribe to Carvan to get all the Absolutely. updates. And uh, we have on just a moment, I'll just open the schedule on 15th at uh, I think at 7.30 p.m. on 15th Feb, we have Art Cinema in India's Forgotten Futures, talk by Dr. Rochana Majumdar um, on the art cinema movement and the film society movement in India, especially talking about three oh. major filmmakers, Satyajit Ray, Rinal Sen, and Ritwik Ghatak, the three popular and most famous renowned Indian filmmakers. On 16th Feb at 10.30 a.m. at uh, the same time, and 9 p.m. PST on 15th Feb for those in America. We have uh, Professor Robert Goldman uh, speaking on Dharma and Dharmas, the moral and ethical legacies of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. So these are the two upcoming sessions. Apart from that, we have some sessions for those uh, uh, people who are on Instagram, who are tech friendly and are on Instagram. We have live sessions on Instagram, one with a very young researcher who has written a book on the Deccan called Lord of, Lords of Deccan from Chalukya to Cholas, Anirudh Kaniseti. And we have another lecture coming up, another conversation coming up uh, on the siege of Delhi by Amar Pal Singh, who is a researcher in the UK. Uh, so these are some interesting sessions that are coming up. Thank you so much, everybody for taking out time. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldman, for taking yeah. out time. Thank you so much for inviting me and such good work you're doing. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, ma'am.